Suzanne Hoffman, cookbook writer, amazing. Um, I don't know if she has books here. She brought them last time and signed a bunch and sold them. But if anyone has any questions, throw them in there. She's going to do this, and I'm just going to be her little helper. Thank you. Uh, the uh, chief assistant, Chef Bud, who is a wonderful host, and I'm really happy to work with him and did a fabulous dinner the other night. There is a theme today. The theme is game, because we were thinking it's still the end of hunting season, and it's kind of nice to do um, some of the kinds of stuff that's available around here. We can buy bison and elk in a grocery store. A lot of people go hunting and have a massive elk to deal with. So I'm going to do um, elk steaks, which I'm going to crust in um, mustard and pecan, and bison steaks. Um, and then I'm going to do three sauces. and. <laughs> Vinegar glazed onions uh, to go with them, and uh, if I move fast enough, which will have to be the speed of light, um, we will um, stuff some tomatoes with ground elk because ground elk is one of the most available, and you get tons of ground elk when you have an elk. And um, it's nice to know some things to do because, frankly, I love hamburgers. Exactly. I'm not a huge fan. Not a huge fan. So. Um, I don't so let me get started. I'm going to start with the sauces because they take a while. And our first sauce is going to be a sour cherry sauce. So here we go on this one. And let me tell you what, what it is. It starts with, um, where is my strainer? Um, let me turn my phone's off, sorry. Oh, mine is probably on. Strainer on the front. Oh, there it is, right in front. Okay, so um, assuming that you have marinated these steaks, or it could be venison, um, and venison definitely needs a marinade. So I have got the marinade here, which I use now. I would normally not have marinated these um, elk steaks had they been medallions, but unfortunately all we were able to get was round steaks. Round steaks are going to be a little tough. So I did marinate them for a few hours this morning in... Um, a sauce that you can use in both elk and venison. And what it consists of is one and a half cups of red wine. Um, and I'm going to do it again because you don't absolutely have to marinate it. So one and a half cups of red wine. I just tend to use a big bottle of, you know, inexpensive red wine Cabernet. Um, but, you know, just for the fun of it, I did bring the marinade, and what you would do with the marinade is strain it. Is the intention of the marinade for flavor or for tenderizing the meat? Yes. Or both? Both. <laughs> exactly. Um, so that's going to give us quite a bit of liquid. I hope we're going to get it down in time. Um, and um, on top of that, we're going to use some garlic. Now, I want to show you, this is already chopped. Everybody kind of knows how to chop it. This is going to be about um, two cloves worth and um, some crumbled bay leaf, which would go in the marinade. Um, and I'm not going to, we're going to have to strain it again a little bit. And I'm going to pretend that I'm putting it in, but I don't want it really in the sauce because it's, you know, kind of not good. And some thyme. And I wanted to show people a trick. If they don't know it, I'll do it with the oregano when we get there, too. If you're doing rustic cooking and you don't want a little bit of stem, not the big stems, you take your sprig and you run down with your fingers and you get the leaves off without having to put down one by one. And it really works on mint and it really works on oregano. Time is a little harder because it tends to come in clusters. But you can do that. Um, and then uh, from the marinade, after you've marinated everything, um, it's also got juniper berries in it. Um, they're a little hard to get, but you take them and so that they bring out their full flavor. Crush them like that. I've already got it in there, so I'm not going to put these in right now because they're crunchy. Now we have three kinds of elk in the United States. Um, and once you've done your marinade and got the, the basics going, and you're finally getting to the point, you add some salt. Um, this is kosher, fine salt, fine sea salt, best to use. And 
I'm putting in about uh, half a teaspoon. It doesn't need a whole lot. And also it doesn't need a whole lot because I'm going to grill the steaks on a pan and I'm going to do it on rock salt. So you don't want to over salt. I don't know whether you guys know the trick, but you can um, grill in, indoors on rock salt without using any oil and therefore you're not frying, you're mm -hmm. grilling, but it does leave the meat a little salty. Um, so you're saying get a pan, fill the bottom with salt really Not hot. that hard, it's just, a, just a light layer. And put the steak on top of put the salt? Put the steak on top of salt. Interesting, I've never tried that. Um, for those of you who really like to cook, this is really the best kind of pepper mill to get because not only can you grind with it, but you can capture. So if you need to measure out a half a teaspoon or a whole teaspoon, this is called a pepper mate. You can get them online. It's an award-winning design. Uh, there you go. Burners no shortage of heat. So some pepper in this. I've got plenty made already, so we're we're already there. Um, and I forgot the vinegar, about a fourth a cup, balsamic vinegar. And I'm going to let that reduce. Um, it's probably going to take about. Eight minutes, I think. I and mean, what, what you want it to do is thickly coat a spoon. Pardon me, I have so much food up here that I uh, I'm going to have to re look at my notes. Are any of these recipes in your cookbooks? They're in the forthcoming cookbook, which is called Bold: How Amer American Cuisine and How It Came to Be. And it's coming out um, probably in summer um, this next year from Workman Press. So they're not in a book right now, but they will be in a book. So I wanted to tell you some stories about elk um, as we're going along here and we're starting this uh, thing. One is we have uh, three kinds of elk. Elk arrived in the United States about 120,000 years ago. <laughs> um, they came over a path that the red deer, actually red deer came over, an ancient path that was followed by the people who came over the Bering Straits later on. Um, and from the red deer, they developed elk and our kinds of, both our kinds of deer in America. Um, we have four, the Thule, which is in um, northwest um, in Seattle and Washington area. Our main elk here, which I am remembering the name of, um, and I'll get to, if I don't ring it up now, I'll bring it up when I'm doing the elk. Um, but I did want to tell you a little story since it's Christmas time, and that's about reindeer. Now, Here's the story with reindeer. The males begin to get their antlers about in March. They harden in July and they lose them in November. The females get their antlers in June and they keep them until they've had their calves in spring. So if, if you've, and the only other ones, the only males that keep their, rain, their antlers as long as the females are the juvenile males. So if you think on this, that means Dancer and Prancer and Dunder and Dictum are girls. But Rudolph was a juvenile boy. For but sure. Rudolph was a juvenile boy. There's no question in my mind about that. <laughs> <laughs> so while that's cooking, I'm going to start our next sauce. And what I'm going to do, since um, elk is also very Western, it's kind of a Western theme sauce, and that is an apple jalapeno sauce. <coughs> now, jalapenos are native to America. It's got a kind of Western flavor. Apples were brought in, of course, by the settlers. Not the first bunch, but a little later. Spread like crazy across America. There was actually a kind of a Johnny Appleseed who brought them from, um, many of them from state to state. And they became one of our major fruit crops, but they are not native to America. So I'm going to combine um, two-thirds of a cup of apple juice. You guys want to put all that in? Oh, in the pan. Okay. <coughs> right for the pan. And then the, the trick with this one is apple cider. So I'm going to put in about three tablespoons. Is it apple cider vinegar? No, nope, it's just apple, apple cider. cider. No, nope, it's apple cider vinegar, sorry. Could you use either one? Uh, no. Okay. You need that vinegar um, fermenting on it. Just plain apple cider is probably not enough. Um, of course, I like being half Scandinavian. I like um, apple cider alcohol drink. Um, I don't know if you've ever had pear cider, but it's another really wonderful. And then I'm going to um, stir in the sugar on this one already. It is a half a cup of sugar.
And I'm going to wait until this too coats a spoon. So while those are going, that gives me Ah, thank you guys. It's the lights are in my eyes. Now, when you're doing a sauce, one of the tricks is to have a wider bottom pan if you want it to move along quickly and get to the point where it's boiling and you've got a cover spoon. There's other things that you do in a, in a narrower pan. I'll show you that later, like rice. But for uh, doing a sauce, it's best to have as much heat spread across it as possible. So jalapenos, um, we're going to put in as soon as we get, this is going to take about eight, 15 minutes on that one, eight minutes on that one, and then I'll add the cherries. So in the meantime, I'm going to move along here, and I am going to do um, some, can we turn the toaster oven on? Yep. Some glazed onions. Onions are great, they're sort of grassy, they're part of the allium family. These I had to do ahead of time because they take about 40 minutes. So what you do is you spread them across a tray, you salt and pepper them so that they wilt, um, and uh, you put some olive oil on them, and let me show you. Um, again, you know me, I love Greek olive oil, I think it's the best, so this is uh, one of my latest jugs of it, and I get all kinds of it, I have that. 10 different varieties at home. If anybody wants to sniff it or look at it, taste it, put your fingers in it. Where do you buy it? Hmm? Where do you buy it? I get it from, I have to tell you, I get it in Astoria, New York. And well, that's I, convenient. Huh? <laughs> Where do you get the juniper berries? Huh? Where do you get the juniper berries? Um, you're supposed to be able to get them you in any... In any kind of, in any, you know, good grocery store, but they're really hard to find because Scott, our program director here, went looking for them in Montrose and couldn't find them. Go to Norwood and pick them off the tree. I was going to say, yeah, yeah, there is that. It's not all juniper berries are quite the same. Really? I just pandry. 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 There's another one that's good as Penske's. Or a company I get them from in Arizona is is Mount Hope Wholesale. They sell all kinds of dried spices and there. Yeah, if you can't get them at the store. Is there a substitute? Not really. I'll, you could, I suppose, just make it very early with margarine and thyme. Um, <laughs> And gin reduction. Some good beef eaters reduced down to a syrup. So let's see if we got a cook spoon here yet. Yeah. Nope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so these have um, been, been for, you spread them on a tray, just with your olive oil and their salt and pepper, cover them with tin foil, which you might put down here. And, pardon me for disappearing from the uh, seat for a minute. I do have a better piece in there. There's a little piece. So the last five minutes, you take them and you sprinkle. Now this is a double recipe. What I wanted was boiling onions. They're very hard to get. So these are pearl onions. It's not quite 40 minutes, therefore, that they, you need to do them. It's really a little more like uh, 30 minutes. And then I'm going to put about three tablespoons of balsamic vinegar, and that's going to bring out their sweetness. And they go back in the oven, in this case, a toaster oven. This is the first time we've had an oven in Books and Cooks. We've done a lot of these. I should know how many. No idea. Well, that's one of the things we're going to have to solve, and we we'll sort of know it here. It's getting an oven. How oh, hot do you want this? Oh, uh, pretty hot. Mm -hmm. It's pretty hot. So, I'm going to eventually make a gentleman jack sauce, mm -hmm. but that's a pan sauce, and it's going to be pretty quick. So, in the meantime, I'm going to deal with.
um, the elk. These are round stakes, as I mentioned. But I'm going to add a little nice fillet to them. And what I'm going to do is take Dijon mustard. And I'm going to coat the edge of these guys. Ready to buy um, we got these from um, the Aldosaro girls, who I have donated them. You can get, I think, the steaks occasionally in the market, you can certainly get ground out. I'm using a pastry brush. Uh, you know who has out often, but it's in larger quantities, is Mount Valley Fish and Oyster in Montrose. Also a highway. Yeah. All oh, right. I know. And they, and they all deliver here. Oh, really? Yes. If you give them a and I can one they come up. So let's heat up that um, skillet. Then I'm spreading some chopped pecans, just regular old pecans, but you need to get them fairly fine, so use a Cuisinart or something like that. And press the edges. No. If you don't have a pastry brush, you can probably roll up a paper towel and use it kind of as a brush. Um, or you could be me and use your fingers, <laughs> which is my favorite way to cook. People always talk about crusting and how hard it is to get stuff to stick to it, and the mustard is one, one trick to make it work. Now, here's the trick with the frying rock salt. This is kosher rock salt. This way you don't need to put oil in the pan. You just put a light layer of rock salt in. Look like they're getting very close to the And when that's hot, we are going to do our elk. In the meantime, I am also going to do a bison steak. Now, at the end of the what's called the Great Slaughter, there were only 300 buffalo left in America, if you can believe that. The buffalo arrived in America at about uh, 200,000 uh, BCE, and they were huge. They were humongous. It was pre the last ice age, which would have been the beast, uh, Boont, Mindel, the Mindel ice age, but in America they're called a different name. And um, they were enormous, and their horns were um, did not go forward. They went to the side, which means that they probably were not a herd animal to start with, because it's very hard for a herd animal to be around something <laughs> with six feet horns that are stuck. The farm pretty much died out with the Ice Age, and when they reappeared, there were two kinds of buffalo that, um, that evolved from them. Uh, a larger and a smaller, and the smaller one was uh, was hunted to extinction. So all of our buffalo are the descendants of the single one that survived the Ice Age. Um, and there are, came two species from that, an East Coast species, which you rarely see anymore, but still is in the east, Upper East Coast in Northwest uh, Northeast America, and the kind that we had in the West. And there were so many that they were virtually teeming. They were the, the largest herd animal that, that the world has ever known. There were 30 to 50 million of them, it, it's believed. And 
everybody has this image of the American Native Americans hunting them on horseback. Well, they didn't have horses. So they were very, very rarely hunt unless you lived in some place like Council Bluffs, Iowa, and you could do a group hunt and herd them off a cliff. But most of the people that we think of as the Native Americans who rode the horses and hunted the buffalo only came over across the Mississippi from the east part of it to the west part of it after they got the horses from the Spanish. So the whole culture that we identify with American Indians with the feathers and running and with the spearing and animals was only approximately 150 to 200 years old, barely evolving when it was destroyed. So that culture was not even settled. They had gone from being a pe a people who saw their kinship through the mothers to people who saw their kinship through the father. Um, they had been agriculturalists and gave up agriculture. It had been very poor agriculture in Illinois and, um, and Indiana and the El um, areas along there. And they had this whole new life um, hunting the buffalo. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. then also, it was the settlement period of you know Am Americans. We owe the fact that the buffalo survived to several people I'm going to name because some of them are familiar. One was an American Indian named Walking Coyote. The others were Scotty Phillips, Fred Dupree, and Charles Goodnight of the famous cattle driving trail, C.T. Jones, and with their help, eventually the National Park Service and the U.S. Forest Service. When they saw that there were only about 300 animals left, they decided that, um, that it had to be saved, and they got the Park Service to um, open up a preserve. And from them, we have buffalo, and they're still wild. Even if they're farm-raised, they're still wild. They're grass-fed. We have now about 350,000. So no longer even a million, but they're coming back. What's the difference between buffalo and bison? Nothing. Really, okay. technically, the American buffalo is a bison. That's right. And buffalo is the wrong word for them. Um, the word elk is the wrong word for what we have here. The English, in all of their glory, who could not pronounce a single thing, um, in fact, called uh, sherry wine was from Jerez, and they couldn't pronounce it. And sardines were um, actually um, called fumados from Spain, and they, in England they're called fair maidens. Um, <laughs> they saw black and white birds here, and they called them magpies, because the native magpie in England is this little black and white bird, where here they're just a black and white crow. Um, but they also saw this animal when they got over here and saw the antlers and everything and called it an elk. Now, what they call it an elk from was, was their name for the native English moose, which isn't even an elk, it's a moose. But they call it an elk. Don't even go into it. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's right in the waistband. So are we coating? Yes, we're coating a spoon here. So I am now going to add um, cherries. He's smelling like they're different right here. You want to put cherries in this sauce? I'm putting cherries okay. in this sauce. This is about a cup and a half of tart dried cherries. You can also get tart canned ones. I don't think they come out as good. Um, the real thing to do is have fresh ones, but you can only get those, as you know, about six weeks in the summer. So these are the tart dry. They come um, several kinds of things. Some of them are flavored, so watch out which ones you're getting. Um, they tend to be very sweet, so I'm putting them in. I'm putting in a pinch of allspice to give it yet another hint. Oh. And I'm going to keep putting that down until we get a really nice uh, tart cherry sauce. It's still pretty sweet. And on this one, we coated. Very tasty. I'm going to add half of an apple that's been cored and sliced. And let me show you something. Make sure you get it down to a fourth of an inch. You're not going to just only slice it. I want you to slice it this way first, like you would an onion. If I get my fingers to work. me nervous. <laughs> then slice it. I have yet to cut myself. You make me nervous. <laughs> now everybody misunderstands a half an inch. Let me show you a half an inch. A half an inch is only that much, right? Much less than you would think. So, but it's still pretty chunky. Um, I have it already cut, so we're going to do that. 
and the jalapenos. Now you can put in one to two. Um, I do them in little strips. You, if you want to make it prettier, you could do it in circlets. This, this, the apple is not peeled. The jalapeno is cut in about an eighth of an inch strips, which you do, and I'm going to make you nervous again. Do you this part? No, I'm all right. The trick is to, in almost all slicing, is to get a flat surface. So a lot of stuff, even an onion, and I'll show you how to do that, you get it flat first, and then you can cut your strips like this. They're about an eighth of an inch. I don't know if you guys can see this. And then from that, turn them around. I really like this is my knife. Putin's off might be going too fast. Okay. Did someone just say they smell something burned? Yeah. I didn't. It's, it's, it's a pecan, probably. Yeah. Is it alright if I put these? Yeah. Right. Please do. Nice. The same thing with an onion. The best way for rustic cooking is get it some, a flat surface like that. Then another flat surface like that. Take off the peel. And one of these I want an eighth of an inch. So like that, very, very thin. I try to keep it in order. An impossible job, as you probably know. I'm a craftsman. I'm good at this part. But it's the history and all that stuff. I don't know. Well, does anybody come from Chicago? Do you know what the name Chicago means? Well, the whites arrived at Chicago, and they found the Illini Indians. And they liked this place on the, on the lake. It was very marshy. They asked the Indians what the name of it was, and they said Chicago. And so they named it Chicago. It happens to mean the stench of wild onions. <laughs> so once you get it that way, anyhow, I, I get it in just halves, but you can chop it once you get it that way anyway. The trick, again, is the flat surface. So those onions are probably glazed. I can go in a dish. Our steaks are about done, and let's put on, did we put the buffalo steak on it? No, it's on your face, so. Okay, so it's going to go in. Oh, yeah, these guys are done. I'm going to have a look at your onions. I think they're close. I don't know if they're quite. I don't know if they're going to pull it out. Sauce and meat is done. So we have a cherry sauce. Mm -hmm. Wow. You want to check those to see if it's what we were thinking? Okay. Let's put them all. It smells delicious. Let's put the cherry sauce. Pointed spoons, another thing that you really, really need for cooking. We have more cherry sauce somewhere. Can we pour it out? Well, I'm not sure. Starting with <laughs> sauteed pan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
This is a pan sauce, so this you do right after you've done your steaks. And it takes um, I can't I can't lose my gentleman Jack. Gentleman Jack. The whole story is really kind of interesting. In about um, 18, the 1870s, a man named Jasper Newton Daniels decided he was going to make something better than a Kentucky bourbon. And to this day, it is not called a bourbon. It's the same as a bourbon, but it is not called a bourbon. It is called Tennessee whiskey. Um, and he took the same kind of mash of uh, rye and corn and other ingredients and, but he invented a rack of filter made of sugar maple, and the filter is 10 feet high. And he takes two weeks to, to filter the mash through the, the liquid through the, through the rack. Um, and from that rack, he also, uh, what comes out, he also takes the, uh, like a sourdough bread, the ingredients to start the next batch. So it's, it's uh, fermented from its same continuous um, thing, and he uh, called it Tennessee whiskey, and it became very popular, and he invented a square bottle. I don't have a regular Jack Daniels with me, and it didn't change for more than a hundred years, and then in 1988, they decided to do a more refined uh, whiskey, and it became called Gentleman Jack. It is filtered twice, otherwise it's pretty much the same, but it has mottos, which I have to read to you. Um, <laughs> a gentleman knows naughty and nice is one of the things, and a gentleman shows off, shows up, not off. And these <laughs> mottos go with it. Also, whiskey, by the way, loses about eight percent um, as it goes through its process from filtering to barrel, and, and goes into the air and evaporates. And it's called the angel share. <laughs> So I'm taking uh, onions and butter to start with this. Your pan's hot. It's on. It's right. Okay. Two small yellow onions, just very thinly sliced, as I was doing, kind of in an eighth of an inch slice. Um, and I'm going to um, spread the onions on a plate and wilt them. With salt. Yeah. <laughs> now, normally yeah, this takes about five minutes, but I'm going to speed up the, the effort today so we can get to the stuffed tomatoes and uh, pretend that they're wilted. Um, and I'm going to put them in saute pan with about three quarters cup of water, but I'm not gonna use that much today because I want it to go quickly. And once those are really wilted, and the water is almost evaporated, then I will start with the butter and the whiskey. So, where are we? We have lost the cherry sauce. Maybe I'll turn up as we go. Yeah, I'm maybe. sure it will. We have the applesauce almost done. Now, the Spaniards call jalapenos chili because um, peppers because they reminded them of the peppers that they had. I want to show you what the ancient peppers used. It's called long pepper. You can still use it in India. You can get it if you want to. I don't particularly advise it. It's just an interesting sort of artifact. Can you open it? Sure, open it. I'm dying with this. But I can't smell it in the back because I just want to smell it. I've never seen these. Read what's on it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. While we're waiting for the onions to wilt, I'm gonna show you something to do with um, 
ground elk since that's so available. And that is stuffed tomatoes. So what I have done here, and I will show you with my one, is take a good sized tomato, and I've been, in the summer I used heritage tomatoes, heirloom tomatoes, um, all summer long. Now these tomatoes aren't so great. But um, you can do the same thing with an onion, with a um, eggplant, although you, with an eggplant you should um, soften the shell first. Um, with peppers, with um, zucchinis. I'm going to take the core of it out. Now I happen to again be a biscuit cook, which means a little bit. So I'm going to do it with my hand. I try to save the juice. And I'm going to chop the core. Just a rough chop is fine. Save the cap. Now, to this, I'm going to add about a pound of buffalo. I'm um, sorry, elk. Now, to stretch it, some people would add rice. But if you're going to do rice, let me tell you a couple of tricks. One is to use arborio, which is risotto rice. And the reason is, is it absorbs flavor much better, it absorbs juices much better than any other kind of rice. The actual rice that got to Europe is short grain rice. Everybody now thinks of long grain rice and that's what they, they use. But the original one, now the soldiers of Alexander the Great actually brought rice to Europe, but they thought it was expensive and weird, and they didn't particularly use it. Rice was really brought in by the Arabs from across northern Africa into Sicily and into Italy and from there. And in northern Italy, um, where the cooking is so much different from southern Italy, they worked and refined and hybrid the rice till it became this very fat, plump kind of rice that you can use for risotto. Now, I use it for just about everything. Um, because it does absorb juices so much better. And everybody thinks that you've got to measure rice. You don't have to measure rice. There's a trick. You put in, Bud and I were talking about this earlier. Any amount you damn well feel like, right? In your pan, you cover it with water, and you use one thumb, one woman's thumb, over the top of water. You put it on the burner, you bring it to a boil, you lower it down to a simmer, and you use your knuckle. I, I learned from a Japanese chef in London, he feels it just above his fingernail. So almost to the top of your first knuckle, so right there. Considering a Japanese finger. So it's right. about so the my same finger, as yeah. my, my thumb would be. So you bring it to a boil, take it down low to a simmer, you clap on your lid, boil it 17 minutes without lifting the lid. That's the hard time. <laughs> I have no problem with that. I have plenty to do otherwise. All right, so what I'm going to add here to my stuffing is mint, chopped mint. Now, I, this is not a recipe, so I don't know any amounts. You guys just have to you know, like wing it like I wing it. And until it looks right. Um, as I was telling Susan the other day, one of the things about cooking is you have to think flavor and you kind of know your balance just in your mind. This is um, oregano. It goes really quite nicely with mint. You wouldn't think so because they're so drastically strong each in their own way. And then I'm adding um, the proverbial onion, a lot of garlic. Getting pretty close on your hands. Okay. It's just gone. All right, then here we go with the dumpling jack. First, I'm going to put in two tablespoons of butter. Is this unsalted? Un unsalted butter? You know, I don't care on that one. I'm from the West, so I grew up with salted butter. A lot of East Coast cooks. Um, are really attached to unsalted and think it's better, but um, it's never really much made a difference to me. It's just a matter of how much you balance with salt and pepper. Um, we didn't have unsalted butter when I you know out in out in the West, 
The whole story of how butter um, got around America is interesting because the whole wood industry of the Northwest was about making butter barrels and butter lids, <coughs> an industry that completely fell apart. And um, then, after that, um, the trick was to find a way to make butter that would last to the market, and all kinds of things were tried, various kinds of paper, um, again, very wooden boxes, and in about, not sure of the date, but I think around 1920, what was thought up was a waxed paper. And that preserved it and held it for shipping, and that is what we still have. And if you've ever done baking, which I'm sure you have, you use the wax paper again to even wipe your pans and your, um, your uh, cookie sheets with. But that was, it's funny, but we've had this wax paper now for decades, and nothing has replaced it, and nothing has changed it. I tend to use um, Irish butter or pasture lands butter because it's from grass-fed cows. And all of us who eat organic and from grass-fed animals, and why get grain-fed butter? You know, you're basically doing the same thing. It's a little more expensive, but it is something you can do. You can get it in Montrose. They have Irish butter in Montrose. I don't think I've seen it too. Um, so once I've gotten my butter. Clark's has a decent butter. I think yeah, it's Irish butter. I don't know it's it's in a green and gold, gold label. Carrigan. Carrigan, there you go. That's a good butter. It's a delicious butter. It's expensive. It's twice the price. Put it in my pan and that. What I want to do is leave it until it's not, you know, cook it until it's not raw. So keep the flavor, but just get rid of the alcohol. Um, and that was three-fourths of a cup. That is about two minutes. And this can go with the rest of our sauce over there. It smells very healthy. It does. In this picture? Uh, no, that's a gentleman jack. Oh, this one? Yeah. I'm going to there for now. Okay. two minutes and you've gotten the raw off of it, you put in another two tablespoons of butter. It's my kind of <laughs> now this should be a hot sauce. The cherry sauce should be a lot warm sauce, but the, but the apple jalapeno jelly can be chilled. Can I mix the falcon and tomatoes and Yeah, what you do? sauce that you kind of spill over the top of your steaks. Something like a major deep butter, only it's bourbon. Bourbon and butter? It sounds like a good way to finish the end. And onion. Um, tomatoes. Now, I soak my currants in Rancino oil. And I do that to give them an extra pine flavor. Um, I, you know, I don't know whether how many of you know Red Cena. It's a pine flavored Greek wine, but I keep them two kinds soaked. I keep some soaked in Red Cena and I, that and raisins as well. And I keep another batch soaked in um, a, like a Muscat wine for dessert sauces, a sweet wine. What is this? Currants. Currants which are not really currants. These are tiny little grapes, and we've come to call them currants. The real red currants of Europe are a red berry about the size of those juniper berries, and these are really from the island. Zant they're called Zante currants because they're from the island of Zantinthos, Zantinthos in the Adriatic Sea of Greece. Um, and they're still little grapes? They're little grapes. Oh, interesting. They're little tiny raisins. Did we put them in there? Here, no. 
Okay, so they go in here too. And again, we're, you could put rice if you wanted to. And this is just a matter about how much sweet you want. To put. And when you say rice, it would be already cooked? At least partially. I know we're running low on time in here. Did I put garlic in? I think I yes. A lot. A lot. <laughs> It's relative. <laughs> How unlike me. <laughs> Take your guy. Sorry for my hands. Stuff him. You should get about six big tomatoes from a pound if you're not using rice. Now, this, since these need to bake, and we can't bake them here, they are, there's a whole thing of them over there. Tomatoes are fruit. They were declared a vegetable by Act of Congress. Just like an Act of Congress is now declaring. It eats the sauce as a vegetable. Pizza is a vegetable. Yeah, Pizza is a vegetable. You can serve it in school. Oh, sorry. At least it's more substance than ketchup, which was the last vegetable I it's the ketchup. they labeled. I guess french fries would be a vegetable then, too, right? Oh, they are. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you know, potatoes. There are actually around 400 varieties. We get very few here. We owe our main one, um, the russet potato, to Luther Burbank and his experiments with food in uh, Northern California. Just like we owe peanut butter to, uh, I can't think of his name again. Uh, I just know what to do with it. George Washington Carver? Yeah, yeah, Washington. Washington Carver, yeah. Um, so I actually could have done eight or so to eight with, with, them, with the uh, thing. It depends on, again, on the size of your tomato. They can be stuffed in. You then cover them with their lids. It doesn't matter unless you're completely crazed and OCD. It does not matter <laughs> which thing goes on top of which. Although I have to admit that at times I've kept track. It's definitely something I would do. <laughs> I'm missing a top. Okay. <laughs> oh no. Oh, there it is. <laughs> and then if there's any juices left, which there usually are, you could use some other, if you didn't shop everything, or you can use some white wine. Pour around the edges, stick it in the oven, uh, 375, 400 till they're done, which could be 30 to 40 minutes, depending on the size of your tomato and everything. So we have now gotten through quite a number of dishes here, and we have gotten through our hour, so it is time to eat. Okay. It's a good time. It's a good time. Any more information? Any questions? What did you have in there for 17 minutes in the pot? I missed. What, the rice? Oh, it's the rice, okay. The rice is for 17 minutes uh -huh. without lifting the top. Right. You want to put steam in there. And um, as Bud had pointed out to me, he was taught it's better to have a little more water than less because you can drain it off, although your rice might be a little sticky. But if you have too little, you're going to get a scorched bottom uh -huh. on your rice. On the other hand, sometimes crispy rice is called for, so you want a little less water. Um, again, I still very much use risotto rices. Um, do you refrigerate those, Susanna? Your, your rices? Huh? Do you, do you refrigerate your, your rice, rice for storage? No. No, I never have. I've heard for the arborio and the sushi rice that they should be refrigerated to keep for the life of them. You know, I've, I've used them for years and years and I've never put them in the refrigerator. So I don't see the point. It's supposed to be dry anyway. So, I mean, they are the dried grains, so um, I've never done that. I'm no, I've never heard of that. Yeah. You could, well, the thing of getting short grain brown rice, you can't get it. Um, you could try that. 
But I do recommend a short grain rice for anything that you want really to absorb the juices. If you just want to put it on a plate with butter and some kind of topping, I don't think it matters so much. Um, the kind of rice that came to Carolina and became American was long grain rice from India. Um, but the main rice of Europe was short grain rice. Yeah. Um, you said there are three kinds of elk. Yeah, what four kinds. Three, um, what they were and how did you kind of tell them apart? Where did I put it? Um, mm, mm. Steaks. Okay. I need my glasses now. Sorry about that. The word now that's being used a lot, Wapiti, is a Shawnee word. Um, and so it came from a particular our Midwestern uh, Native American group. Um, and the elk that we got are the Rocky Mountain elk, which is what we have here. And by the way, Wapiti means white butt, even though it's tan. So I don't have a clear idea why that became our baby. Uh, it, the, the truth of the matter is that all cultures divide up um, color differently. I know this is a really odd fact to talk about, but um, everybody perceives the same spectrum of color. How it's divided is very different from culture to culture. I used to get in huge fights in, uh, in Greece because they would send me to go get the red sweater and it was brown. Or they'd say, cook it until it's red but it was brown. In fact, some dishes in Greek are called reddened beef, and it's really just ground beef. And I've known Greek couples to get in fights over what was green and what was blue, because <laughs> it's very different. So, you know, the fact that they consider it a light color white. The first color that all cultures um, split off is black and white. The third one that they always split off is red. So it goes in order. The next one is yellow and or green or the reverse. And then after that, there comes a plethora of different things, often by metaphor, like cherry or raspberry or something like that. So when you're dealing in a different culture and even in different cooking, you'll get very different tales of what some, some color is. Um, and just, you know, you try to adapt to the culture and try to see what they mean. So there was the Rocky Mountain Atul, T-U-L-E, um, and the Roosevelt. They're all living in the West. Um, the kind that we have here, as I said, are pretty much the Rocky Mountain. The two are in the Northwest, and I'm not really sure where the Roosevelt are, except I know they are in California. Other questions? Before you made the sauce, you talked about American. I did, and that was the wine and balsamic vinegar, um, crushed bay leaf, thyme, um, I didn't show you stripping oregano, but it's just as easy as um, stripping thyme. So is mint. Again, you can take it. It's, it's a little harder with mint, but you can take it from the top and strip it down. You can't do the tip. And mint right now is kind of stemmy, so it's not so good. Um, and that, also, that, hmm? that was also the basis of the cherry. Sauce. Yeah, and salt and pepper and garlic and onion is the and juniper berry is the basis of the marinade. And you can use it on venison, you can use it on elk, you could use it on almost you could use it on uh, anything. And for stuffing, um, you don't have to use elk. You could use ground buffalo. You could use ground. I love it with pork because pork is so tender. Um, you could use beef, but beef tends to be a little hard, so if you're going to use beef, I would mix it with pork, or I'd add a little cream or milk to soften the beef. Yes? And there's the milk just went on me, someone changing the recipe. Oh, yeah, I was just saying, I have a recipe this month in Savior Magazine for Swedish meatballs. And it was the meatballs and the potatoes that they always go with, and lingonberry jam, right? And the cooks, the test cooks at Savior, um, Swedish gravy is a milk gravy. That's what they had on their farms. So there's lots of stuff with cream and sour cream and butter. And I am still, I'm half Swedish and I think I'm half butter. And uh, I will eat it, you know, I don't, I just use the bread as a serving tray. I don't even eat the bread, I just eat the butter off of it. So, uh, 
that I sent it in as a milk gravy that you pour in a pan after you've done the meatballs with a little um, flour as a roux. And when I, the magazine came out, they had changed the milk to beef stock. Well, beef stock is pretty disgusting. Um, it can be canned, it can come out of a box, it's got beef flavoring in it, it's really awful, and I've had, you know, a, an ongoing fight with Salvier. I mean, they're very apologetic, but it's too late, it's out there in print. And what they wanted was something that looked pretty, or milk gravy doesn't look pretty. You know, it's white. It's got a cream color, so I mean, they wanted a nice brown, photogenic gravy. Um, but they changed the recipe. But if you guys like Swedish meatballs, they're pork and beef and, uh, and butter, lots of butter. Um, the recipe is in there. Just remember that it's... Uh, oh, and I also turned in with them um, a Swedish beet salad, which was made with sour cream and heavy cream and horseradish and dill. And in, in apple season, you can add apple. And they didn't put it in the magazine, but I'm willing to share that for anybody who loves beets as much as I do. The horseradish is the real trick. Anyway, please, let's um, slice up these steaks. Uh, there's plenty of it, and I will search for the rest of the cherry sauce, and uh, plenty of tomatoes, steak, sauces. Tell them, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.